John chapter 21. While you're turning, I want a couple of make a couple of announcements for you. I've had some questions about how to uh, be able to participate in the camp meeting bucket since because of the COVID, we've not been passing the plates and we've not been uh, having the kids go around with the buckets. And uh, some have just been putting it in the box and some have been earmarking it in the envelopes and putting it in a box. But uh, tonight we've decided we're just going to put the camp meeting bucket out there on the table beside the box. So whatever you want to put in the camp meeting bucket, of course, if you're not familiar with that, that's been going on a long time. Uh, but all that's taken in uh, those buckets uh, helps to go to uh, defray the cost of the camp meeting. And uh, it adds up over the year. And uh, so uh, it's a real blessing to be able to do that. And so that camp, I saw it a while ago. It's already been placed out there if you'd like to participate in that. Also, we're going to have a work day here uh, on Saturday morning, July the 25th, from 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> Come on. We're going to work you to death. That's what we're going to do. You going to do. You won't show up for church the next day. Um, 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. We'll just do two hours. How about that? We can handle that, can't we? Uh, that's Saturday, uh, the 25th of July at 8.30 a.m. Uh, all righty. That's all I had on my little list here to uh, remind all of you of. Let me thank all of you for being here. It's been a good Lord's Day today. And uh, looking forward to what God has in store for us tonight. The Gospel of John, chapter 21, Jesus has risen from the dead, and he's involved in his post-resurrection ministry, and uh, Simon Peter has backslid on the Lord and took about half of the disciples with him, or half the apostles with him, out into the Sea of Galilee to go fishing, and uh, they fished all night, you remember the Bible said, and they didn't catch a thing. You know, you're not going to do a whole lot when you're away from the Lord's will for your life. And um, so Jesus is uh, on the beach that morning, on the shoreline. And uh, they see him out there and he asked them, do they have any meat? And of course they said no and told them to cast the net on the right side and they shall find. And you remember the nets filled, they were about to break. And uh, they, got, they got them all into shore. Simon Peter jumped out and... Uh, when they realized it was the Lord and he drug the net in and all of that. And you remember that they got up there on the shore and they had a, a good meal together and uh, just enjoyed seeing the Lord and, and uh, fellowshipping with Him. And uh, the Lord, at a certain point of that uh, encounter, uh, slipped off with Simon Peter, just, just them two, just Jesus and Peter. And you'll, you'll remember that... Um, the Lord asked Peter, he said, Simon, lovest thou me more than these? You remember that conversation? I, I, I don't know exactly what these are. I've heard messages preached on what these are. They, some preachers say that these were the boats, these are the fish, or these were the lifestyle, or whatever the case may be. But three times he asked him the question, do you love me? And uh, Simon Peter, of course, each time said, Lord, you, you know everything, you know I love you, and, he said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. When we come down to verse number 18, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Our Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for this message. And uh, Holy Spirit, I need your filling. And I need your touch to preach this thought that you gave to me the other day. I need your strength. 
And I'm not going to be able to do this on my own, Lord. Never can do this on my own. But I need you. I need you to fill me and anoint me. Lord, you've got something for me to say to this crowd tonight. And I pray that we'll say it in just the right way, in just the right spirit, the way that you gave it to me. And I pray, Spirit of God, that you'll touch hearts tonight, deal with hearts. Lord, we pray if there's be anyone here tonight that's lost without Christ, we pray, Lord, that they'll be saved this evening. And we pray that you'll touch the hearts of your people tonight. Draw us closer to you. Help us to realize, dear Lord, that things are not always going to be the way they are right now. Things are going to change if we get the opportunity to live long enough. So help us to prepare, Lord, for the things that are down the road. Help us, Lord, to get past this living from moment to moment and just living in the moment and just soaking in whatever we can get out of the moment and realize that we need to be making preparations for our future. So I pray, Spirit of God, that you'll direct the service tonight the message, the preaching, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. In the midst of this conversation between the Lord Jesus and Simon Peter on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the Lord Jesus lets Peter have a privilege that most of us have never had and may never have. He let Simon Peter get a little glimpse into his future. And after that conversation, there were two things that Simon Peter knew for sure that he didn't know before that conversation, but he knows it now. Number one, he knew that he was going to live to old age. And secondly, he learned how he would die. Most of us never get that privilege. As a matter of fact, I've never met anyone who knew for sure they were going to live to old age and knew how they were going to die. But Simon Peter was given that great privilege. And though my natural man has never been given that privilege of knowing that I will live to an old age or or how I'll die, the Lord has let me get a glimpse of my spiritual future. And you say, well, how bright is that, preacher? As bright as the promises of God. I titled the message tonight a very odd title, but God laid it right on my heart when He showed me what He wanted me to preach. I've titled the message tonight, Preparing for Where We Don't Want to Go. Now, where did you get that, preacher? Well, that doesn't sound very positive. It doesn't sound very encouraging. But I'm basing it on what the Lord Jesus told Peter in verse number 18. He said that when thou... uh, Let me get back to it here. He says, When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee, whither thou wouldest not. Preparing for where we don't want to go. You know, as a student of the Bible, we understand that in its proper context, and we don't want to preach the Word out of context, but uh, in its proper context, we know that the Lord Jesus was uh, giving Peter that revelation uh, that you're going to live to be an old man, but when you're old, there's going to be another that's going to come and gird you. And they're going to take you to a place that you don't want to go. In Peter's case, it would be to a cross. Now, what Jesus is telling Peter here in verse number 18 is this. And I'm not preaching primarily to young people, but I want the young people to really pay attention to what I'm saying right now. Jesus told Peter, he says, you know, when you were young, you girded yourself. 
And you pretty well went wherever you wanted. And you, for the most part, did whatever you wanted to do. And nobody stopped you. Most of us, if not all of us, in this building tonight, under the sound of my voice, are still doing that. You get up in the morning, you pretty well take care of yourself. You get ready for your day, you get dressed, you eat breakfast or don't eat breakfast, it's up to you. You go to work or you take a day off. You plan out your day and nobody tells you a thing. You pretty well, pretty well just do whatever you want to do. Jesus said, Peter, there's a day coming when you're old. And he says, you're not going to be able to go where you want to go anymore. And you're not going to be able to do what you want to do anymore. And as a matter of fact, you're not even going to be able to go under your own power anymore. Another will gird you and will take you to a place that you don't want to go. As many of you know, all of you know, my dad has been suffering with dementia for about three years now. This past week, he had to be hospitalized, and he's still in the hospital. And I don't say this in a way that is for some kind of pity, or some kind of uh, uh, talking out of turn about my family. God laid this on my heart. But my daddy's made that turn now, and he has no idea who we are. The only words I got out of him yesterday that was recognizable, he called me sir, that's all he called me. But as the other day, I was down at the hospital, and I... They, they had to get him up out of the bed. And uh, I was sitting over there on that bench and, and his back was to me and they picked him up and his body was just basically limp and the nurses were holding his entire body weight. And I watched that and I watched my dad and God touched my heart and that verse came into my mind. My dad was a brilliant man. I'm not preaching about my dad tonight, okay? I'm preaching about what the Lord would have us to do, but I'm using my dad as an illustration. My dad was a brilliant man. He was the director of maintenance control at Piedmont Airlines. His job entailed talking to pilots when they would start encountering problems on their planes. And he would tell them, or tell the maintenance team, how to fix that plane over the telephone. I said, Daddy, how did you ever sleep at night knowing that if you made a mistake on your job, it could cost a plane load of people's lives? He said, when I felt like that plane was safe enough to put you and your mama on it, I let it go back on the line. I was told that one night when he was on night shift, there was a problem with a plane and uh, Dad was at his desk there in Winston at the uh, airport, and, and uh, some of them came into the office, and Dad was sitting in his chair with his head back and his eyes closed, and he was doing this right here. And they said, Taylor, what are you doing? He said, I'm tracing the wiring diagram of that jet engine so I can tell that pilot how, what needs to be done to fix that engine. And now a nurse and a CNA have to hold his total body. The opportunities that he was given in life. I hope he took advantage of every one of them. Because he's in a place now that he never wanted to go. And he's being girded by another. If we live long enough, if God lets all of us live long enough, Someone else will have to gird us. 
And we may be taken to a place that we never wanted to go. We may think we're really something now. We may think that we can come and go as we please and do whatever we want and make ourselves happy and live our life just like we want to now. But the day will come when perhaps one of us may be taken to the land of dementia and Alzheimer's. We don't know that before the sun comes up tomorrow morning that one of us may be girded and taken to the land of a dis- disabling stroke. None of us know tonight if we're going to survive through the remainder of this service and get home alive because tonight it might be God's will that one of us is girded by another and we're taken into the land of a disabling trauma. Or we may be taken into the land of destructive cancers or deteriorating diseases. Why are you telling us this, preacher? I'm telling you this because tonight we have the opportunity to do something for God. How much of our life have we already wasted on ourselves and our lusts? How much time have we already wasted that we could have used for the Lord on the lust of our flesh? which is the desire to do something? Or how much of our time have we wasted on the lust of our eyes, which is the desire to have something? How much time have we wasted on the pride of life, and that's our desire to be something? The days that God wanted to use us are long spent, and we can't get them back. When Jesus went by a blind man in John's Gospel, chapter 9, and uh, the disciples said, What does this man do? What does his parents do? What does his family do? That he was struck blind. He said, They've not done anything. This man was born blind that I may receive glory this very day. And Jesus said, I must do the works of him that sent me while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. My dad was a great Christian, led me to Christ. Some of the greatest Bible discussions I've ever had in my life was with my dad. And though his body is still here, and though he's still breathing, and though his heart is still beating, my dad's gone. And his opportunities to do whatever he was going to do have come and gone. But Jesus told Peter, He said, that's going to happen to you, Peter. You've been able to come and go just like you want. But the day's coming when another will gird you and take you where you don't want to go. So I've laid out the situation. I've given you my own personal family testimony. But preacher, what you haven't told us is how do we prepare for where we don't want to go? And if if we're going to a place that we don't want to be, what is there to prepare for? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because the Lord Jesus Christ told Peter how to prepare for that day. In two words, in verse 19, he said, follow me. Don't just give your life to the Lord for salvation and make that's all there is to it. Yes, an experience of salvation will take you to heaven. But walking with Christ and giving your whole heart to Him and living for Him and and absorbing yourself in His Word and living by His Word and obeying His Word and, and being faithful to Him as He is faithful to you will help you turn out good in your judgment. 
May I say that by following the Lord, there was three things that Simon Peter was given that all of us that will follow the Lord are given. He received pardon for his soul when Christ saved him. He received peace for his mind when he was at his rope's end after he had denied knowing the Lord. And then the Lord gave him power to serve him. This fisherman who had backslid on God and had went out and wept bitterly after denying the Lord three times, thought his life was over, thought his ministry was over, thought he had ruined everything that Christ had set up for him. Can you imagine the pain in that man's heart that night outside the high priest's house when Jesus turned and looked when the cock crowed? Peter looked at him eyeball to eyeball and went out and wept bitterly. But we thank God for his mercy and his second chances that on the day of the resurrection, on the morning of the resurrection, uh, the gospel of Mark records for us that the angel that gave the message to those that came to the tomb says, go and tell my disciples and Peter. The Lord wanted Peter to know he still loved him. He wanted to know he'd forgave him. And he wanted him to know that he still could use him. If we're heading to a place one day, according to the Bible, that we may very well go, it's, it, it's most likely not going to be to a cross. But it's going to be to a place we don't want to be. We prepare by following Christ. First of all, by depending upon His promises. Learn to depend upon the promises of God. The first promise of God that any of us needs to accept is the promise of eternal life. The Bible tells us our friend Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, we become partakers of the divine nature. We're born again by the Spirit of God through the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon that cross. I hope that you have claimed the promise of eternal life and I hope that you're depending on His promise of your eternal life. But not only is there the promise of eternal life, but Jesus has given us promises to live by. The Lord doesn't save us and then throw us out there and say, well, do the best you can. He's given us His Word and His promises in this Word for us to live by. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The promises of God are promises not only that we're going to live forever and be forgiven of our sins, but they're promises that we can live our day-to-day -day lives by cleansing ourselves of all filthiness and perfecting the holiness of God within us. The Bible still says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And you can depend upon these promises and you can live by these promises because all of these promises are true. There's not one promise in the Word of God that's a lie. There's not one promise in the Word of God that God is not planning on fulfilling in your life. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in Him are yea and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. By, by depending upon His promises. Secondly, by following His examples. The Lord Jesus left us examples of how to live and how to, how to thrive and how to live for Him in this world. Peter reminds us that He left us an example of how to live in conversation by the things that we say and the way that we say them. 
We're so loose with our tongues and our lips. We are so easily, oh, we all are so easy to throw our mouth into gear before we put our brain into gear. And we just rear back and let it fly. And, you know, we, we all in our flesh from time to time will say, well, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind if that's the last thing I do. But is that really the last thing you want to do? Is being spiteful and hateful to someone? Jesus was never like that. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. A bitter hateful, condescending mouth is not of God. He also instructed us in Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 and other scriptures that we're to follow His example of compassion. Not what we say, but what we show. In Matthew 9 36, The Bible says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In the gospel messages, the Lord Jesus was moved with compassion on lost people. He was moved with compassion on sick people. He was moved with compassion on people who were out of their mind. He was moved with compassion on people who had just lost a loved one. And Jesus never had a, aha, I told you so, or I told you that would happen. But he always showed compassion. And many times he was the only one that showed the compassion. You remember in John's Gospel, chapter 8, the story of the adulterous woman? You remember that they brought her uh, just, I believe, kicking and screaming. I believe they jerked her out of that bed. I don't believe they gave her a chance to put any clothes on or cover her nakedness. I believe they drug that poor woman down the road. Had she done wrong, she sure did. Had she done something worthy of dying, according to the law of Moses, she sure did. And she was as guilty as she could be. And they threw her down in front of the Lord and said, Now according to the law of Moses, that woman is to be stoned to death for her sin. Now how say you? I don't believe that woman was sitting there with her head looking at Jesus and saying, Well, what are you going to do? She knew she was guilty. I believe that her head was down. I believe that she was probably getting ready to take a position to be ready to brace herself for the, pul- the, 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 the being pummeled with stones. And you remember Jesus told that bunch, He said, well, go ahead. But the, the one of you that don't have any sin, you throw the first rock. And of course, the scripture tells us they all turned around and walked away. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. Now, wouldn't it have been something if the Lord said, Now, you dirty, vile, reprobate of a woman, I ought to stone you myself. Ain't you got no better sense than to do what you've done and you got caught and you deserve to die? Well, the world in which we live in, we we wouldn't be surprised to hear those words to somebody who was at the lowest point of their life. But Jesus said, woman, where's your accusers? She raises that head up and she looks around and she said, there's no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. He had compassion. Guilty? Yes. He didn't just have compassion on people who weren't guilty. He had compassion on the the worst and the vilest that he came across. 
We're to follow His example in conversation, what we stay, say, and we're to follow in His example of compassion, what we, uh, what we share or what we show. And finally, he, we're to follow His example in commitment. And that's where we stand. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, the Bible says of Jesus who, when He was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not. Watch this. But he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He committed himself. He was committed to the cause for which he came into this world. Now my friend, the days are coming. We may be taken suddenly. We may never reach old age. We may never see old age. And we probably don't know how we'll die. But if we live long enough, the day will come that all of our opportunities to have lived for Christ and done for Him will be gone. Lastly, the last thing the Lord laid on my heart of how we may prepare for that place we don't want to go is by laboring for Him while we can. Not just depending on His promises and following His example, but laboring for Him while you can. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 tells us, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with thy might. None of this halfway stuff. None of this stuff for a show. What God gives you to do, what God shows you to do, don't do it with a half heart. Do it wholeheartedly. Do it with all thy might. Because he said, for there is no work. There is no device. That's reasoning. Nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You see, whether we go suddenly or whether we go in an old age, somebody's going to gird us the last mile of the way. And our opportunities will be gone. Labor for Him with all of your might. Labor with Him in spite of the criticisms that people love to give us. Do you know who the biggest critics in the world are? The people that don't do anything. And the only people who never make mistakes are the people who never try anything. In Mark's Gospel chapter 14, Mary of Bethany had saved up and bought that alabaster box full of that perfume, that ointment that was a, worth a year's wages. She saved up and she got it with one purpose in mind, and that was to break that box and anoint her Lord for His burying. And the night she did that, only her and Jesus knew what she was doing, and boy, she was doing a great and a mighty work, and all she got was mouth and criticism and saying, why did you waste the ointment? Why did you break the box and spill it all out? Why was this waste made? We could have took that money and give it to the poor. Jesus said, you leave her alone. Did you hear me? You leave her alone. For she hath wrought a good work on me. For she is anointing me against the day of my burial. And he said, as a matter of fact, while I'm at it, what she's done tonight will be recorded as a memorial for her for the rest of recorded time. I don't see any of us in the Bible. So I want you to next time that you're out trying to do something for the Lord and everybody wants to criticize you for it, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, I don't believe that's the best way to do it. You'd have been better off to have done it this way. 
just remember what Jesus said about Mary. Leave her alone. Lord, make, make them leave me alone. I didn't do it for them. I did it for you, Lord. And then, of course, serve him, labor for him while you have the opportunity. Galatians 6, 9 and 10, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them who are of the household of faith. Now, I want to give you the meat, and I'm done. Save the best for last. Amen. Why? should we prepare for the day that we perhaps won't know anything anymore? Why was it, why was it so crucial that my dad spent his years preparing for where he is now? He don't even know where he is or what anybody's doing to him. Or why he's like he is. He has no idea. This is why you need to prepare. Number one, so that we can leave a goodly heritage for those that's going to follow us. I was blessed with parents and in-laws that knew the Lord. Three of them are in heaven. And all three of them left behind a goodly heritage for us to follow. We want to we wanna go, we want to follow the Lord. Mom and dad followed the Lord. Mom and dad loved the Word of God. My daddy-in-law, my daddy-in-law went through the Word of God so many times, his Bible was so marked up you could hardly even read the text anymore of his notes and his thoughts, so engrossed in the Word of God. My friend, there's people that are following you and there's people that are following me. And What will they say of you when they file by your casket? But not only do we need to prepare for that place we don't want to go so that we can leave a goodly heritage, but secondly, so we can leave a mantle of work that someone else can pick up and go on with. And Elijah went to heaven when God took him up in that chariot of fire. His mantle fell and Elisha took that mantle up and said, Lord, I'll take that mantle and continue the work. The work was started in a little mission 49 years ago. And the man that started that little mission, God called him home within just weeks or months of him starting it. And before he died, he picked the phone up and he called a 22-year-old preacher boy. He said, would you come over here and help us? And that preacher boy stayed for 45 years and four months. And now that little mission founded the Welcome Door Baptist Church. But he left a mantle of work that we can pick up and carry on. And lastly, we need to prepare because we want to cross the finish line with victory. It won't matter when we cross the finish line if we're completely out of our mind because of a disease or because of an injury. It won't make any difference. I don't have to hold on to my salvation. Jesus has got that. And I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit and I'm kept by the power of God. And praise be unto God. One of these days, if I live long enough, somebody's going to gird me and carry me where I don't want to go. And my opportunities to do for the Lord will all be gone. And all I'll have left to face Christ with is what I did here while I had the chance. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, in Jesus' precious name, 
We thank you, Lord, for that conversation that you had with Peter that day that you have privileged us to hear. And Lord, we don't know what our end may be. It may be a cross, but Lord, whatever our end may be, we know that if we live long enough, the day will come when we won't be going under our own power anymore and our chances will all be gone to do anything for you. Now, Lord, there's not one thing that we can do about the past. Prior to July the 12th, 2020, there's nothing we can do to change that. But, Lord, we have opportunity tonight to come. If we're unsaved, to come and be saved. We have opportunities tonight to come and and recommit our life to, to your service, Lord. Say, Lord, I, I've been slack. I, I've let up. I've let, I've let circumstances and things in life derail me and get me away from serving you and Lord, things have gotten me out of the Word of God and out of the will of God. And Lord, tonight I want to start this thing back right. Lord, I just want to come tonight and get on my face before you and just tell you I'm sorry. And dear Lord, that I want to spend what time I do have left making sure that I'll leave behind a good heritage and a good work. And I can cross over Jordan's old stormy tide into glory and victory. Speak to hearts tonight. The altars are open. We're going to sing a song. Lord, I just pray that you touch hearts and pray the folk will respond to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. What's our number, Brother Scott? 316.